I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's International Studies Public Forum. As always, I'm your host, Professor Sarah Goodman from the Department of Political Science. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge our co-sponsors for tonight's event, uh, the Institute for International, Global, and Regional Studies, the Department of Sociology, and the Department of Political Science. So thank you to everyone. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Rogers Brubaker, Professor of Sociology and Foundation Chair at UCLA. To begin on a personal note, as a student of political science interested in questions of immigration and national belonging, Professor Brubaker's work was among the most influential in my early years of graduate training. Indeed, it inspired me to pursue what is today a comprehensive and all-encompassing research agenda on political membership. So I have you to thank, or blame, I haven't decided yet. Um, in any case, it's a real privi privilege to have you here today to discuss your work. Uh, Professor Brubaker is a sociologist by trade, receiving his PhD from Columbia, but his work enjoys quite the interdisciplinary reach. From contributions on Max Weber and social theory to countless works on, on the politics of ethnicity and race, his research reaches all corners of social science. In fact, his work has been central in shaping new subfields and literatures that breach disciplinary lines, most obviously the field of citizenship and migration studies, which I, along with so many other of our, my colleagues in uh, social sciences, uh, work in. Indeed, Brubaker's 1992 book, Citizenship and Nationhood in France and Germany, is canonical. To begin, it gave scholars a new understanding of citizenship, not merely as a procedural feature of constitutions, but as an instrument and object of social closure. To account for variation in citizenship policy, Brubaker forwards an elegant and concise argument. Different definitions of citizenship are shaped by different concepts of nationhood. While most of the literature has engaged with this argument at face value, you may be familiar with the dichotomy of the off-sited ethnic Germany, civic France. What many overlook, I think, is his interesting and nuanced argument on how cultural idioms shape citizenship. It is not mere inertial force or cultural factors that shape citizenship outcomes, but instrumental decision-making by elites in various historical and institutional settings. This account of historical institutionalism laid a foundation that scholars are still building on 22 years later. Indeed, no work of citizenship studies today goes without reference to Brubaker's work. His greater body of research has, have, um, have made numerous other significant contributions to the study of ethnicity more generally, including his 2004 book, Ethnicity Without Groups, his 2006 collaborative book, Nationalist Politics and Everyday Ethnicity in a Transylvanian Town, and countless articles. More recently, his work integrates the study of religion more closely with the study of ethnicity and nationalism. His book, Grounds for Difference, is forthcoming with Harvard UP. Uh, Brubaker has taught at UCLA since 91. Before coming to UCLA, he was a junior fellow in the Society of Fellows of Harvard. He has been awarded a MacArthur Fellowship, a Presidential Young Investigators Award from the NSF, uh, the fellowships of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, and um, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. He finally was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2009. So please welcome me in joining Rogers Brubaker this evening for his talk entitled Linguistic and Religious Pluralism Between Differences and Inequality. Well, thanks so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I hope that I am fully alert here, having been 11 time zones away uh, a couple days ago. Uh, I am still adjusting to California sunshine, but I will do my best here. At least I didn't wake up at 4 this morning, like uh, yes, the previous morning. So my talk addresses a very broad question. That is, through what political, economic, social, and cultural processes is difference transformed into inequality, and specifically, how are linguistic and religious pluralism implicated in the production and reproduction of political, economic, and cultural inequality? Now, this talk and the paper on which it is based uh, are part of a larger project on the social organization and political expression of cultural difference. This project would focus on language and religion as arguably the two most consequential domains uh, of cultural difference and politically consequential domains of cultural difference. More specifically, it would focus on 
linguistic and religious pluralism as modes of pluralism that are different in various ways. They're phenomenologically experienced in different ways. They're interactionally negotiated in different ways. They're culturally elaborated in different ways. They're socially organized in different ways. They're legally regulated in different ways. And they are politically contested in sharply different ways. So that's the bigger project. And I want to begin by sketching some of the concerns and questions that motivated both the talk that I'm going to give this afternoon and the larger project on linguistic and religious pluralism. So first, why religion and language? Or to put the question in a different way, why religion at all in view of the fact that my previous work has focused not on religion but on ethnicity, race, and nationalism? It, well, it was initially my understanding of race, ethnicity, and nationalism as a single integrated field of phenomena rather than as three separate fields of inquiry as it's sometimes um, done in the US that led me to think about including religion or certain aspects of religion as part of the same field of phenomena. Since religion is, among other things, though of course not only, a basic and often descent-based form of social and cultural identity and a domain of what you could call categorically differentiated cultural practice. This led me to see religion in its identity forming group constituting aspects as both analogous to and as intertwined with ethnicity, race, and nationalism. And therefore as part of the same broad family of forms of cultural understanding, social organization, and political contestation. Now a second motivation for the paper uh, worked in a somewhat different direction. This emerged from a dissatisfaction with certain aspects of the tradition of work on ethnicity associated with anthropologist Frederick Barth. The perspective on boundaries first developed by Barth almost a half century ago has been immensely fruitful and it's profoundly shaped my own understanding of ethnicity, including, relevantly for this talk, including my inclination to extend the study of ethnicity to include what I call ethnicity-like aspects of religion. But Barth's injunction to focus on the nature and dynamics of boundaries rather than on what he somewhat dismissively called the cultural stuff enclosed by those boundaries has the disadvantage of flattening out different forms of difference. Now, it's obvious enough that gender or class or citizenship or ethnicity are very different forms of difference in terms of their embodied experience, in terms of their cultural elaboration or their social organization or the ways in which they're contested politically. But the Barthian tradition, along with much political science work on politicized ethnicity, treats ethno-racial, ethno-linguistic, ethno-religious, ethno-regional, and ethno-national forms of difference as functionally equivalent. And this tends to obscure important differences between the social organization, the legal regulation, and the political expression of linguistic pluralism on the one hand and religious pluralism on the other hand, differences that are consequential for the relation between difference and inequality. So while it's useful and important to bring ethnicity-like aspects of religion into a broader field of analysis, it's also important to think about the different forms of cultural stuff, to use Barth's term, and the different forms of social organization, of legal regulation, and of political contention that are characteristic of linguistic pluralism on the one hand and religious pluralism on the other. Now, the final preliminary point I would make about the motivation for uh, this work is that my interest in the relation between difference and inequality grew out of a critical engagement with Charles Tilley's theory of categorical inequality, which he elaborated in his book called Durable Inequality. Now, I've had a long-standing interest in what I call the social life of categories, that is, how categories and systems of classification work across a variety of substantive domains of social life, 
in the first instance for my own work in the domain of race, and ethnicity, nationalism, and now religion, but also in fields like law, or citizenship, or gender, or deviance, or medicine, or psychiatry, and so on. And I found Tilly's argument about how categories work in a variety of domains uh, intriguing and powerful, since Tilly argues that categories work in more or less the same way across a large variety of domains based on a small set of elementary mechanisms that he calls uh, opportunity hoarding on the one hand and exploitation on the other. Like Barth's theory of ethnicity, uh, though I felt uh, Tilly's theory of categorical inequality loses something by flattening out different forms of difference. So I found myself resisting this argument that categories work the same way across different domains of categorization. So these are some of the concerns that motivated the paper, and I now want to sketch some of the main lines of the argument. The paper considers the relation between linguistic and religious pluralism and inequality in four domains. The first is the political and institutional domain. And I focus here on the formal rules that privilege some languages or some religions and disprivilege others. The second is the economic domain. That is the processes that confer different value on different languages and religions, different economic value. The third domain is the domain of cultural and symbolic inequality. And here I'll be concerned with the discursive and symbolic processes that confer prestige, honor, and negative prestige or negative honor, that is stigma, on particular languages and religions. And the last domain is the domain of informal social relations. This involves the differential treatment of people who speak different languages or practice different religions, as well as the ways in which linguistically or religiously differentiated networks entail differential access to the resources that flow through social networks. Now I'm going to consider the first three domains separately, and I'll skip over the fourth uh, for reasons of time, and then I'll try to tie things together in the conclusion. Now to keep things manageable, I limit my attention to the modern era, and I focus primarily on Western liberal polities and societies. I want to say a few things about the first of these scope conditions, that is what I mean by the modern Era. I mean a set of developments that has fundamentally changed the political, economic, cultural, and social significance of language and religion, and of linguistic and religious pluralism in particular. One of these developments is the development and global diffusion of the modern state, which is characterized by direct rather than indirect rule, by intensive interaction with citizens, by universal public education, by a public sector that provides large numbers of jobs, and by an ascending formula of legitimacy, that is a, a way of understanding legitimacy as arising from the people rather than as descending from God. A second development closely intertwined with the rise of the modern state is the development and global diffusion of nationhood and nationalism as the prevailing way of imagining political communities, uh, and also of legitimating independent statehood. A third development is the emergence of an increasingly urban, mobile, literate social order, and a correspondingly fluid division of labor. Now, what's the significance of these three for my talk today? The significance is that all of these three developments make language a crucial form of cultural capital, a central focus of personal and collective identity and a key terrain of political struggles. A fourth development, that uh, an aspect of the modern era, uh, on a more abstract level, is the emergence and increasing differentiation of a series of more or less autonomous and self-referential spheres of life, each with its own constitutive values, its own frame of reference, its own causal dynamics. So these are often, uh, there are a number of ways of enumerating these, but most commentators would refer to the political sphere, the economic sphere, the scientific sphere, the artistic sphere, 
the legal sphere as differentiated uh, and autonomous spheres of life. And as these spheres become more autonomous, so too, especially but not exclusively in the West, religion itself becomes a more autonomous, differentiated, and to a considerable extent, privatized sphere of its own. Now, religion never becomes completely privatized, even in the West, and the claims of public religion challenge the putative autonomy, the normative insulation of these other spheres that I mentioned, like the political sphere and the economic sphere or the legal sphere. Still, there's an interesting historical reversal that's taken place over the course of several centuries in the West. Uh, while language has become much more central to public life over several centuries and much more politically contentious, religion has become less central to public life and less politically contentious, notwithstanding the resurgence of public religion in recent decades. So I'm talking about a period of several centuries over which religion has become less central to public life, less contentious, although I believe there's been an, an interesting reversal in that pattern in the last uh, few decades. Now, a further aspect of the constellation of modernity concerns the expansionary political, economic, and cultural dynamics that have generated linguistically and religiously heterogeneous polities. How does this happen? Well, through conquest, colonization, and other forms of state building that have brought heterogeneous populations within the ambit of a single polity. Though, of course, this isn't only in modernity that this happens. Pre-modern empires did this as well. And in a world characterized by vast between-country economic and demographic gaps, large-scale international migration is continually generating new forms of both linguistic and religious heterogeneity. So by regrouping and drawing new boundaries around linguistically and religiously heterogeneous populations, by internalizing heterogeneity within political units at a moment in world time in which states are beginning to problematize heterogeneity and move towards tighter forms of political and cultural integration, these large-scale developments, political, economic, and cultural, have transformed latent heterogeneity, heterogeneity that nobody really paid much attention to, into manifest heterogeneity that's considered as an issue or sometimes as a problem. And these developments have made possible new forms of inequality. That is, when languages and religions exist in relative isolation from each other, though of course never in complete isolation, they are not unequal. Uh, the problematic, that is, of difference and inequality, of inequality linked to forms of cultural difference, comes into being only when different languages and different religions are brought into regular and intensive relations with one another under the same political roof. And when the tightly integrated nation state emerges as the dominant model of political organization. A final specifically modern development is the transformation of linguistic and religious heterogeneity into linguistic and religious pluralism. What do I mean by this? In the domain of language, this involved the transformation of dialect continua, that is, uh, long, big stretches of space where one form of speech and writing shaded over into another through imperceptible variations in a continuous manner, the transformation of dialect continua into standardized, codified, bounded, recognized languages. And this has at least loose parallels in the crystallization of fluid and variable traditions of religious practice into a set of, again, standardized, codified, objectified, recognized religions. Now, of course, the awareness of religious difference is, of course, and of linguistic difference is, of course, much older. And in some contexts, difference has been understood in terms of reified, bounded entities, sharp boundaries, and so on, and sometimes, on some occasions, but historically, between Christendom and Islam. But the idea of a global set of equivalent, mutually exclusive religions is a distinctively modern idea. And the processes of objectification and standardization and reification are still going on today, generating a heightened self-conscious awareness of religions as distinct and bounded entities. 
So both language and religion come to be understood as fields of categorically distinct rather than continuously varying cultural practice. Now, I want to just clarify here that I'm speaking of the way in which religion and language are understood and represented. Of course, in reality, things are much messier. There are forms of syncretism. There are forms of shading. They're shading over one thing into another. The world does not, languages don't come in reality into such neatly bounded packages, nor do religions, but they are understood prevailingly in this pluralist way, that is, as distinct bounded entities. Now, with all of this as a prologue, I now want to get into the meat of the, the discussion here. I turn now to the political and institutional domain, and I begin with the obvious fact that states often identify quite strongly with particular languages or particular religions. Now, under conditions of perfect cultural homogeneity, if you imagine a, a situation in which the boundaries of the polity coincide with the boundaries of linguistic or religious communities, under this condition, the fact that a state would identify with a particular language or religion would not entail inequality. So the point here is that inequality presupposes heterogeneity, presupposes difference or pluralism. Now, of course, no modern state of any substantial size is anywhere near perfectly homogeneous. But some states are indeed relatively homogeneous. But the point I want to make here is just to remind you that such relative homogeneity as we do see in certain polities is often produced by the erasure, sometimes unspeakably violent, uh, of earlier forms of heterogeneity. That is, extreme forms of inequality can be self-liquidating or self-abolishing. The destruction of heterogeneity, whether it happens through assimilation or expulsion or even through mass murder, the destruction of heterogeneity destroys the sociodemographic foundations for certain forms of inequality as well. So apart from extreme cases of ethnic cleansing or genocide, large-scale language death has massively reduced the linguistic diversity of the world. That, and this language death has resulted from extreme forms of inequality between languages as languages backed by massive power and massive wealth confront languages associated with neither. And this inequality has become so in extreme as to be ultimately self-liquidating. That is, as certain languages have disappeared, so too in those instances has the particular form of inequality that was responsible for their disappearance. And even less extreme forms of linguistic inequality can be self uh, liquidating, for example, if linguistic heterogeneity is not continually replenished through ongoing immigration in a country like the US, for example, then intergenerational linguistic assimilation may erase the specifically linguistic inequalities that are characteristic of post-immigration contexts. Now, my interest here is not in these sorts of extreme or self-liquidating forms of inequality. I'm interested rather in more routine and chronic forms of inequality. In the political domain, routine and chronic inequality arises above all from a very mundane fact, from the fact that public life is conducted in one language rather than in another. States that is necessarily operate in and through language. And this is all the more true and all the more consequential as their activities, that is the activities of states, become more communication intensive. That is, any modern states cannot help but massively advantage people with certain language repertoires and massively disadvantage others in their capacities as students or clients or citizens or prospective public employees so that language repertoires become an important determinant of life chances, and the rules and practices that govern the language of public life become chronically and pervasively politicized. And this points to a key difference between language and religion, one of a series of key differences that I'll point out. While language is a necessary medium of public life, religion is not, at least not in the same way. What do we mean by public life? We mean things like public discourse, or administration, or law, or the courts, or the police, or education, 
or the media or even public signage, all of these operate not just in and through language in general, but in and through a particular language or a small set of particular languages. Now, even if religion in some sense, in, for example, a broad Durkheimian sense of distinctions between sacred and profane, even if religion in this very broad sense could be seen as a universal part of public life, it's not the case that public life must operate in and through the medium of some particular religion. Now, it's true that complete neutrality in matters of religion is widely recognized as a myth, not least because the state can't help but take a position on the difficult and contested question of what it is that counts as religion. And one can easily identify pervasive traces of Christianity in the public life of Western liberal democracies, thinking of things like the reckoning of dates according to the Christian calendar or the organization of holidays or the privileging of Sunday as a day of rest. Yet, at the same time, contemporary liberal polities, even those that have some kind of established church like Britain or a couple of the Scandinavian countries, these countries have made substantial or though contested moves toward a more neutral and even handed stance towards differing religions. And these moves don't have any counterpart in the domain of language. That is, you don't see states moving toward a more neutral and even handed uh, treatment of all the languages that are spoken on their territory. So the state can approach neutrality or even handedness with respect to religion, even if such neutrality is impossible ever to fully achieve in practice, but it can't even approach neutrality with respect to language. So the conditions of possibility for neutrality or even handedness uh, for the equal treatment of languages or religions, the conditions of possibility are quite different for language on the one hand and religion on the other hand. Now, I want to consider here three kinds of inequality uh, that are generated by policies and practices that privilege particular languages and religions and disprivilege others. So this is all within the political and institutional domain. The first is unequal opportunities for specifically linguistic or specifically religious expression or activity. The second is unequal access to what I'll call extra linguistic or extra religious goods and opportunities for people who have different language repertoires or different religions. And the third is unequal opportunities for the intergenerational transmission of linguistic or religious identities. So the first kind of inequality arises from restrictions on specific forms of linguistic or religious behavior. Now, in liberal states, private linguistic conduct and private religious conduct enjoy strong legal protections, and much public conduct is protected as well. But public means a bunch means many different things. So you may have a right to speak a minority language in public places with other speakers of that language, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily have a right to communicate with public officials in that language or to receive schooling in that language or to receive public services in that language. So this points to another key difference between religion and language. Since language is a universal medium of social interaction, speakers of minority languages are compelled either to use the prevailing language or to rely on translators and interpreters whenever they need services or whenever they need to undertake some kind of interaction that can't be done inside the minority language sphere. Now, how often this is the case depends on the extent and range of what sociologists call institutional completeness or structural pluralism, that is the extent and range of parallel minority language institutions such as hospitals or media institutions or schools or stores or service providers or churches or clubs or even economic niches. Uh, but religion is different. Except for people with very strong religious commitments, and this is an important exception, but except for people with extremely strong religious commitments, religion is more compartmentalized. It's more sectoral. It's not a universal medium of interaction. And this makes religious life more self-sufficient than linguistic life. In the following sense, one can lead one's entire religious life among your fellow co-religionists. 
But immigrants, for example, can't lead their entire linguistic lives because their entire linguistic lives means their entire lives. They can't lead their entire lives among co-linguists. The fact then that linguistic life is not self-sufficient and that one must therefore go outside of the sphere of co-linguists uh, generates specifically linguistic forms of inequality. Now a further key difference between language and inequality uh, sorry, language and religion in liberal states, is that religion enjoys much stronger legal protection. And this is thanks to the strong institutionalization of the principles of the free exercise of religion and of the equality and non-discrimination between religions. There aren't comparably strong institutionalizations of the principles of free exercise of language or equality and non-discrimination between languages. But still, what counts as religion? The fact that law gives such special protections to religion uh, means that there's a struggle over what counts as religious. There are struggles to define the sphere of religion, to demarcate the sphere of religion. So for example, in the US, there was a long, two decades long struggle to, uh, in the courts to define whether Scientology counted as a religion or not. Because if it counted as a religion, it meant it was tax exempt. Ultimately, that was a struggle that Scientology won. Now, this power to define what is religious gives states uh, some leeway to get around the norms of the free exercise of religion and, or non-discrimination between religions. So I'll give you a couple of examples of that. France, uh, as some of you may know, was able a couple of years ago to ban the wearing of the face covering niqab by defining it as a cultural practice, not as a religious obligation. Now, what did that mean? I mean, if it were a religious obligation, then France would not have been able to ban the wearing of this full face covering because that would interfere with the free exercise of religion. But by defining it as a cultural practice, then they were able to uh, enforce this ban. Another example comes from a European Court of Human Rights decision that initially barred the display of the crucifix in Italian classrooms. The point here is that this decision generated a storm of protest um, in Italy and elsewhere, and the court later reversed itself on appeal, defining the crucifix in this context as a symbol of political culture and tradition and national identity, not primarily as a religious symbol. Why did this matter? Well, if it was a symbol of culture and national identity, then the crucifix could be displayed in the classroom without involving the illegitimate state promotion of a particular religion. Right? If it was considered a religious symbol, then that's a, that would be illegitimate state promotion of one religion over others. But by defining it as a national symbol, um, this, there was a way found around this. So I want to make, I want to argue you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the one hand, there have been very real and important moves towards a more neutral and even-handed sta stance towards different religions in liberal democracies in the last few decades, but this, these moves have their limits, as these examples show. Now, I want to move on then to a second kind of inequality, which doesn't involve restrictions on linguistic or religious expression or activity, but rather, uh, involves unequal access to extra-linguistic or extra-religious goods and opportunities. Things like jobs or uh, citizenship. Uh, this is the terrain of social closure. That is, linguistic competence or religious affiliation is sometimes used as a test or as a qualification for access to scarce and desirable goods. Could be a public sector job, uh, access to a university, or access to citizenship itself. And here again, there's a big difference between language and religion in that religious tests for public office or for employment or for citizenship are today virtually unthinkable in liberal states, but linguistic tests are widely seen as legitimate, uh, at least in post-immigration context. Now, what accounts for this difference? I think there are two factors. One is that linguistic competence, unlike religious affiliation, is widely understood today as functionally and substantively relevant as a qualification for various positions, for jobs, uh, for 
citizenship itself, whereas religious competence or religious affiliation is not understood as a functionally or substantively relevant qualification. And secondly, linguistic tests can be seen as pertaining to acquired competencies that are open to anyone, while religious tests are seen as pertaining to an ascribed status. Now, there's a bit of a problem with the second uh, viewpoint in that your initial language competence is developed, of course, through no choice of your own, while on the other hand, your religious practices or affiliations may be voluntarily changed. And sometimes, in fact, they can be changed more easily uh, and more radically than your linguistic repertoire can be changed, since that, after all, takes time to acquire a new language. But while it is seen as legitimate in liberal contexts to expect people, uh, and notably to expect, for example, the children of immigrants to change their linguistic repertoires, uh, it's not seen as legitimate to expect people to change their religious beliefs and identities. So the normative expectations about religion and language are different in contemporary liberal democratic states. Now the third kind of political and institutional inequality concerns unequal opportunities for the intergenerational transmission of linguistic and religious identities. And once more, I want to highlight a striking difference between language and religion. This can best be seen through a stylized contrast uh, between the dynamics of linguistic and religious reproduction in pre-modern societies on the one hand and in contemporary liberal societies on the other hand. Now in pre-modern societies, linguistic pluralism was more or less self-reproducing. Why? Because linguistic socialization, the transmission of a language from one generation to the next, occurred in families and local communities without any specialized apparatus. Political authorities made no effort to impose linguistic homogeneity, though they did, in some instances, impose religious homogeneity. Now, in contemporary liberal settings, the situation is reversed. It's now religious pluralism that's more or less self-reproducing, in that religious socialization occurs in families and local religious communities, while political authorities make no effort to impose religious homogeneity. But linguistic reproduction now requires what Ernest Gellner called exo-socialization. That is, it requires prolonged and expensive schooling on a scale that only the state is in a position to provide. So the state ends up being much more central to linguistic than to religious reproduction in contemporary liberal settings. Now, of course, Linguistic reproduction or linguistic socialization isn't happening only through schooling. It's not happening only in a way that's controlled by the state. Children acquire basic competence in languages, it's notably in minority languages, from their parents, from extended families. This can be reinforced by the media. But without comprehensive minority medium schooling, it's difficult for minority languages to be fully and durably reproduced across uh, two or three generations. Now, some historically multilingual countries do, of course, provide this kind of comprehensive schooling in more than one language. Uh, and some countries have regimes of territorial autonomy or linguistic parity between more than one language. Examples of this uh, include Canada, Belgium, Spain, Switzerland, and India. But minority languages that are generated by recent immigration do not enjoy any such arrangements. That is, they do not enjoy comprehensive parallel school systems. Regimes of equal linguistic treatment where they do exist are not joinable by new immigration-generated languages. Whereas, on the other hand, regimes of equal religious treatment are, in principle, joinable by immigrant religions. Now, of course, liberal countries of immigration do various things to accommodate the linguistic pluralism that's generated by immigration. You see signage or information, voting materials, bureaucratic forms in minority languages. You may have translators provided in hospitals or in legal settings. You can have various forms of transitional bilingual education. But these kinds of accommodations are very different from the comprehensive parallel school systems, kindergarten through university, or the regimes of territorial autonomy that seek to facilitate the long-term 
reproduction and preservation of multiple languages within a single state. So the liberal state controls crucial instruments of linguistic socialization today, but it has much less leverage over religious socialization. And the upshot, the consequence of this difference is that while opportunities for the reproduction or intergenerational transmission of religious identities are relatively equal in liberal contexts, that is, transmitting a, you're not, a, you're just as, it's, you're, it, Transmitting a minority religious identity is not systematically disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis transmitting a majority religious identity. On the other hand, opportunities for the reproduction of linguistic repertoires are not at all uh, equal. So I want to conclude this section by registering one qualification to the argument that I have sketched. Now, I've been tacitly assuming that the state identified language or religion is in a position of strength. But sometimes the state-backed, the state-identified language or religion is understood as a weak uh, or vulnerable language or religion. And there are policies and practices then that seek to privilege this kind of weak or vulnerable or threatened language or religion. These typically arise in one of three situations. The first involves state efforts to revive or promote a weak or declining language, such as Irish or Welsh. The second involves efforts to protect or support a still dominant but declining or threatened language or religion. And here, examples would be uh, efforts to protect quasi-monopolistic state or national religions from foreign religious competition or efforts to protect national languages from competition from English. And then the third uh, typical configuration when a state protects a weak uh, language arises in the aftermath of empire when uh, new states or uh, understood as the states of and for particular ethnoculturally defined nations use their new state power in some kind of remedial or compensatory way to promote the national language which had been weakened by the preceding regime. So an example here would be the successor states to this former Soviet Union, uh, where states like Estonia or Latvia, for example, are promoting Estonian and Latvian because those languages were seen as weakened by the preceding Soviet regime. Okay. Now I turn to the economic domain, and here uh, I'll go, uh, I'll be much more brief, uh, as well as when I discuss the cultural and symbolic domain. Different linguistic competencies or repertoires and different religious affiliations can operate as forms of linguistic or religious capital. That is, in some circumstances, they can be convertible into economic resources or benefits. And it's easy to see how language can work in this way. In many contexts, the, your prospects for social mobility or for the transmission of a privileged social position depend on your mastery of languages of wider circulation in addition to whatever the prevailing local language is. So for example, in India, this means mastering Hindi and English in addition to the official language of your state of residence if it's not Hindi uh, or in the uh, a former Soviet Union, it meant mastering Russian. Uh, given the hegemony of English uh, as the global lingua franca, then today mastery of English or of a regional lingua franca like Chinese or Russian or Spanish or Hindi is a key form of cultural capital uh, in a very wide range of contexts. And obviously in post-immigration uh, context, language knowledge is closely linked to economic opportunity. Now, it's clear that the economic value of language is powerfully shaped by political processes. So you could say you can't separate out the economic domain from the political domain. Uh, the global economic demand for English, for example, very obviously reflects the history of overseas expansion and Anglo-American hegemony. But once it's robustly entrenched in business networks, in scientific practices, in professional networks, uh, and so on, then English no longer requires directly political support. And its hegemony can become refractory to political attempts to promote other languages. Now, religion, too, can function as an economically convertible form of 
cultural capital and as a determinant of mobility opportunities. This can work through uh, formal social closure or through informal discrimination, uh, but also in other ways. So uh, it can work through what Max Weber called the economic ethos that's associated with certain forms of religious socialization or through the kind of social capital that may be generated by forms of religious participation. But the point I want to emphasize here is that linguistic and religious repertoires and affiliations are not static, they're dynamic. People change their repertoires and they change them for many reasons. But among other things, they are sensitive to the economic value of particular linguistic and religious competencies and identities. And this can lead them to learn one foreign language rather than another, uh, or to convert from a disprivileged to a privileged religion. Uh, again, this, it's not only economic considerations that drive people's choices, but choices are sensitive to costs and benefits. And this holds not only for the choices people make for themselves, it also holds for the choices they make for their children, so that rather than simply transmit their own linguistic repertoires and religious affiliations, parents' concern for their children's economic opportunities may lead them to bring up their children uh, with different repertoires uh, uh, or different affiliations. So they may send their kids to school, for example, in a language of wider circulation than the one in which they themselves were schooled, or they may give their children a religious upbringing different from the one they themselves uh, received. And the point is that cumulatively, such choices can transform linguistic and religious demography. So if you shift here from an individual perspective, from the perspective of, say, the parents who are thinking about their kids' future, you shift from this perspective to an ecological perspective. You can think of languages and religions as competing with one another for adherence within some ecological setting. And I, the point I want to make here is that competition among languages differs from competition among religions. Competition among religions, from among organized religions at least, is competition among organizations. Religious organizations deliberately and very self-consciously compete for followers. They look at their competitors, they see what they're doing, they see who's growing, who's shrinking, and so on. But languages aren't organizations. They compete for followers or speakers in a different sense. Now, of course, there are cases where nationalist organizations like religious organizations try to promote directly one language rather than another. But I'm interested in the way in which languages compete for speakers um, in a more figurative and metaphorical sense without any overt language politics. And this happens just because speakers are not locked into their existing repertoires and children are not locked into the repertoires of their parents. Uh, speakers are aware of that there are many languages. They're aware that these languages have different value. This awareness informs their choices uh, and the result cumulative of, cumulatively of these choices is that the linguistic landscape can change quite dramatically in that some languages may get weaker and die. I already alluded earlier to this mass phenomenon of language death, uh, which happens precisely in this way, uh, while other languages get stronger and stronger. Uh, so notably, English is getting extraordinarily strong as a second language. Uh, and this, is, this happens partly because language is what Abram de Swan is, has called a hyper-collective good. Not just a collective good, but a hyper-collective good in that the value of a language, especially as a second language, the value increases with the number of people who speak it. So it's kind of a network good. Uh, and this can accelerate the process of linguistic change. Uh, it can generate self-reinforcing stampedes out of a particular language. Now obviously there are factors that promote more stable patterns of language use. Uh, these factors include uh, the costliness of acquiring a new language as an adult. They include the symbolic and emotional meanings of languages to people, right? Languages aren't simply chosen because of their economic value. They have symbolic and emotional meanings. And above all, a stabilizing factor is the existence of separate states, which serve as protective political roofs over partic particular languages and shield languages to a certain extent from direct competition. 
but still this ecological perspective uh, on competition among languages can help explain the ongoing spirals of language death on the one hand and the rapid and seemingly inexorable spread of English as a global second language on the other. Okay, now I'm turning to my last domain, the cultural and symbolic domain, uh, the domain of processes that confer prestige, honor, recognition, and respect on some languages and religions while symbolically devaluing or stigmatizing others. And I want to stick to a single point here in the interest of time. And my point is that religious outsiderhood can be culturally and symbolically much deeper and more categorical than linguistic outsiderhood. Now, there's some similarities in the ways that languages, ways of speaking, and religions can get stigmatized or devalued. Languages or varieties of languages, dialects, can be devalued and stigmatized because of their associations with devalued social categories. And typically, this means class categories or ethnic categories or regional categories or gender categories. And religious uh, affiliations or ways of practice can be devalued and stigmatized just for the same reasons. That is, because of their association with devalued social categories. But beyond this kind of devaluation by association with devalued social categories, religion can also be criticized or devalued or stigmatized on its own terms because of its ideational, normative, and political content. And religion is not only a rich target of criticism or stigmatization, it's also and or it can be an active agent of such criticism and stigmatization. That is, the resources for devaluing or stigmatizing other forms of religious practice are internal to religion because religion, at least many forms of religion, are structures of authority in a deeper and different sense than language is. So yes, languages are routinely represented, some languages, as primitive or as undeveloped or crude or uncouth or impoverished or unsuitable for use in some high domains. But it's hard to imagine languages being represented as evil or violence prone or threatening to a whole civilization or way of life in the way that some religions are represented and stigmatized. Now, the stigmatization and devaluation of religion, and not just the stigmatization, but also the criticism of religion, which after all has been central to social theory since the Enlightenment, this can cut more deeply. Languages, after all, have no intrinsic ideational content. They don't make any claims about the proper organization of social life. Yes, there are perspectives associated with Herder or Humboldt or the Saper or Whorf uh, that see languages as constitutive of culture, as carriers of distinctive spirits or ways of being. Uh, but even if one were to accept this view, which, is, which has been widely criticized and uh, uh, I think it's problematically groupist and organicist, uh, but even if one were to accept a, a kind of more moderate version of this view, still the substantive ideational normative content of language would be relatively thin compared with the substantive ideational, cultural, and political content of religions. But religions then have more elaborate ideational and normative content. They are carriers of substantively different ways of life. They make claims to regulate public as well as private life. As a result, discursive struggles to represent and characterize and define religions are intense and high stakes affairs. And this is going on now. Uh, if you look at the ways in which Islam, for example, is represented uh, in public discourse in North America and especially in European countries of immigration. There's an intensely contested field of struggles, and these are struggles in which both Muslims and non-Muslims participate, a field of struggles to define and represent Islam. There's no analogous field of struggles to define and represent, say, Spanish or Turkish or Arabic. And Islam is criticized and devalued and stigmatized, and so are other religious traditions, uh, in these representational struggles in ways that have no counterpart in the domain of language. Okay, now as I said, I'm going to skip over 
the discussion of informal social relations in the interest of time, uh, and conclude simply by trying to tie things together. In contemporary liberal settings, both political and economic forces are much more profoundly inegalitarian with respect to language than they are with respect to religion. On the other hand, discursive and symbolic processes are more profoundly inegalitarian with respect to religion. So let me just unpack this concluding argument. I've argued that public life is massively and inescapably languaged. It operates not just in and through language in general, but in and through a particular language or a small set of languages. And as a result, any kind of general impartiality or neutrality towards language is simply impossible in modern conditions, even though a few states do mandate equal treatment for a small number of long established languages. So states must massively privilege a particular language or a small set of languages, whereas they need not massively privilege any particular religion, even if complete religious neutrality is impossible. And in liberal polities, minority religious beliefs and practices enjoy legal protections and guarantees of equal treatment that are not generally available to minority languages, and certainly not to the languages of immigrant minorities. Religious tests for access to goods and opportunities, not least for citizenship itself, are unthinkable in liberal democratic states, while linguistic tests and qualifications are much more routine and more widely seen as legitimate. Now, economic structures and processes likewise generate massive inequalities between languages in modern settings, but they do not necessarily generate massive inequalities between religions. This is especially striking on a global scale. Language, as I've suggested, is a hyper-collected good whose value increases with each additional user, which helps explain the inexorable spread of English as a global lingua franca, and indeed the inroads that English has made even at the expense of state-protected languages in some domains, like the domain of higher education, where increasingly Educa higher education in many small countries is increasingly carried on uh, in English. And at the other end of the spectrum, the communication value and the economic value of small languages decreases as the number of speakers decreases, which feeds, feeds a spiral of decline that dooms most small languages that are unprotected by a state apparatus to extinction. Religion is of course a collective enterprise, but unlike language, it's not a hyper-collective good. And this means that religious communities are much less vulnerable to the kinds of di di the dynamics of economic demography that doom, for example, small languages. Small religious communities can stably reproduce themselves. They may even grow dramatically, even when they enjoy no special state support or privilege. And this is illustrated for example, by the spectacular growth of ultra-Orthodox forms of Judaism in the US in recent decades. Now, it's true that religious movements can exhibit self-reinforcing demographic dynamics, so waves of defection or waves of adoption and so on, and religions, just like languages, can go out of business, they can disappear. But in liberal democratic context, the demographic dynamics of religion are less acutely sensitive to economic costs and benefits than are the demographic dynamics of language. So both political, legal, and economic forces massively favor state-identified, economically powerful, and demographically robust languages. But in liberal democratic settings, they don't massively favor state-identified, economically powerful, and demographically robust religions to the same degree. And indeed, if you look beyond liberal democratic polities, the fastest growing forms of religious engagement worldwide, namely Pentecostal and charismatic forms of Christianity, are not backed by powerful states. And they do not have massive economic wealth, though they are in fact linked to hopes for economic mobility among poor and marginalized populations. Yet if political and economic forces generate deeper and more consequential forms of inequality between la languages than between religions in contemporary liberal democratic settings, discursive and symbolic processes generate 
more profound forms of inequality between religions, or can generate more profound forms of inequality between religions. And this is because religious difference is vulnerable to deeper and more totalizing forms of devaluation and stigmatization than is linguistic difference. That is, both languages and religions can be devalued and stigmatized because of their association with devalued and stigmatized social categories. But beyond this kind of devaluation by association, religions can be more deeply problematized or criticized or devalued or stigmatized on their own terms by virtue of their intrinsic ideational, normative, political, and cultural content in a way that has no counterpart in the domain of language. And religions, as I said, are not only stigmatized, they are also stigmatizing because they are structures of authority and contain within themselves the resources for authoritatively devaluing or stigmatizing other forms of religious practice. So I conclude then by stressing the fundamental differences between language and religion as media of difference and inequality. Religion is culturally and politically thicker and more authoritative, but generally more compartmentalized in the modern world, while language is culturally and politically thinner, but much more pervasive. So to conclude in a single sentence, uh, though a massively oversimplified one, I would say that the major sources of religious inequality derive from religion's thicker cultural, normative, and political content, while the major sources of linguistic inequality come from the pervasiveness of language and from the increasingly and inescapably languaged nature of political, economic, and cultural life in the modern world. Thank you.
Thanks. Thanks so much. It gives an opportunity to clarify uh, some points. These are two particularly important points that, that you make. One concerns the fact that in many countries, more than one language has the status of an official language. There may be an explicit regime of parity, that is equal treatment of more than one language. I did mention that rather quickly in, in my talk. My point, though, was that this has its limits in that nowhere is that, par nowhere is that regime of equal treatment extended to all languages, and in particular, nowhere is it extended to immigrant-generated languages. That is, these regimes of parity may exist in cases where historically uh, multilingual states have reached some kind of accommodation, some kind of political settlement as a result of nationalist struggles. But the political settlement arrived at that grants equal status to two, or in some cases, like Switzerland, actually four languages, including very small Romance language and so on. So there are such cases, and uh, and, and in fact, it's uh, cases where all, it's really in a in a global perspective. I was talking mainly about uh, the Western liberal democratic settings, but in a global perspective, some you know, official multilingualism of one kind or another is the norm. It's not the exception. So you're absolutely right on that. But the point I wanted to underscore is that the the, the, the I, I would reassert the basic argument that states must massively privilege either one language or some small set of languages. They can't equally treat all languages. And since immigration exists you know, almost everywhere in the world, there are always going to be massive numbers of speakers of other languages who are massively disadvantaged because these regimes of equal treatment, where they exist, are not extended to immigrant languages. Whereas, in principle, regimes of equal treatment between different religions are extended to immigrant religions. That is, they, immigrant religions are eligible for theoretically at least, equal treatment, non-discrimination clauses in a way that immigrant languages are not. So think of it this way, that immigrant, la Im immigrant carried languages are much more massively discriminated against and completely legitimately so than are immigrant carried religions in liberal settings. Now of course, in some other non-liberal settings, those, those protections of immigrant uh, uh, protections may not attach to immigrant religions or to any religions considered non-formal. That's why, that's why I limited the scope of my talk to liberal democratic settings. And part of what makes these liberal settings liberal is that in principle, they do treat all, they do subscribe to the principles of religious freedom and non-discrimination, including towards immigrant religions. Now again, does that mean that they are treat in practice uh, uh, all religions and immigrant religions in particular, and let's say Islam in particular, given its centrality as an immigrant generated religion throughout much of Northern and Western Europe. No, it means that there are struggles over this, uh, but the normative commitment to uh, religious freedom and to, to non-discrimination is, is uh, central to all of these uh, liberal democratic contexts. And in practice, there have been substantial moves toward the more equal and even-handed treatment of religions, including immigrant religions, and specifically including Islam. So that was, that's the clarification I would make about that point. And then about the second point about the content, uh, the, 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 the qualification that you would make regarding my contrast of the you know, religion as a content-rich uh, category of languages as less content-rich. I, mean, I, I accept the fact that uh, languages, of course, are not just um, empty vehicles of communication that are substitutable. You just happen to speak one or another. No, of course. We would all agree that, that languages differ in, in, in some ways, that some languages allow you to say things that other languages don't. My point is that these, you know, there are stronger and weaker formulations at that point. The strong formulation says languages are radically incommensurable from one another. And they simply are, you know, you're sealed up in your language. Your language determines your worldview, your way of life, and so on. I don't think that strong view has fared very well. Weaker views, however, are anyone can accept, and we should accept. But the question is then, what follows from those relatively weaker differences between languages? The fact that there are certain things that you can say in one language with no, that you simply cannot say or express in another. I think this is true, but, but what follows from it? it, it what, what, what does not follow from it, it seems to me, is that people seize on those differences in languages and 
massively devalue one language or another because you can say certain, you know, it just doesn't seem to lead to the kind of deep othering, the kind of deep stigmatization that is possible in the case of religious difference. Now, I don't, I also want to clarify the point about deep othering in religious contexts because, of course, this doesn't happen all the time and one can make the opposite point that religion contains the resources for deep, what's the opposite of othering, right? For, for a deep extension of dignity and uh, a friendship and recognition of others, and we see this, we, you know, we see this all the time. There, you know, there's religion. It's not simply an an othering activity. It's not simply an exclusive kind of discourse. It may be deeply inclusive, and religious discourse has functioned very profoundly in this way in many contexts. I was just mentioning before the talk a, a, a book about the global, religious origins of global humanitarianism, written by a PhD student of mine, uh, which is just come out, and his point is precisely that, that religion allows one to imagine connections and similarities and so on between people, and, and, and this, for example, in, you know, very central in uh, religious discourse in leading to the abolition of the slave trade and so on. So, however, the point I was making was that, that religion also is a terrain, religious difference, religious worlds, and is a terrain on which othering or exclusion or stigmatization can be very deep. And when it happens, it's a lot deeper than the kind of stigmatization one sees um, in the domain of language. We have time for one question. One more question. Yeah. Well, um, uh, it's a, a, a couple questions in the same area. Do you think the world is moving toward a, a single language, uh, considering that uh, language is a hyper-flexive good? And also, do you think that language is going to be English, um, but Yes, exactly. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I, the, the question requires a, a complex answer we could talk about a long time. I don't think we're moving towards a single language. Nonetheless, we are, we are moving towards a situation of a, an overwhelmingly dominant second language. Though no, even then, not just a single second language. We also see powerful regional lingua franca. I just came back from uh, uh, Russia, and it's interesting that in the non-Russian uh, republics that used to belong to the Soviet Union, Russian continues to function even today. It's the lingua franca. It's much more widely spoken than English. So it's not the case that English is everywhere the dominant second language, but it is becoming uh, stronger and stronger as the world's second language. Moreover, English does make inroads even where uh, states do exist to protect small languages. So for example, one of those former Soviet states is, is Estonia, now an independent country. Estonia has a population of about 1.3 or 1.4 million. Uh, what does this mean? It means even with a political roof protecting the Estonian language, it's vulnerable to uh, a lot of erosion. So what may happen, what's already happening, is that higher education, much of higher education is being conducted in English, not all of it, uh, but it may happen that, and, and of course, if you, you know, if you want to have a, you know, your Estonia is part of the European Union, so you want to be mobile, instead of being just thinking of your future as within this very tiny labor market, 1.4 million, you need to learn English. So English become, comes to acquire the status uh, of a kind of second, a second native language in many small countries. And that can mean that over a very long term, the national language loses some status. It becomes not really a dialect, but it does a situation of what linguists might call diglossia emerges, where certain domains and registers are no, where you no longer use the national language in certain domains and registers. So, you know, there's, it's, in this sense, the existence of, sep of, of many, many separate states is a good thing if you believe in the value of linguistic diversity. It is helping to preserve the world's linguistic diversity, but it's only preserving a small fraction of it. You know, linguists some decades ago estimated there were something like 6,000 languages. Well, the number of languages preserved by states is more on the order of a 
you know, a couple hundred. And those other, the, 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 the thousands of other languages are, many of them, unfortunately, perhaps most of them, dying and doomed to die out. And this is a tragic loss of human diversity precisely because of uh, the point you raised uh, earlier, Cecilia, that is, uh, these languages are, are not simply you know, identical vehicles, alternative vehicles for, for saying the same thing. They're close, especially when we talk about languages that are not you know, languages uh, of, of non-state societies that were, were language, what we would call religion, perhaps, although the category is very problematic, and way of life are very closely bound up. And with the disappearance of a whole way of, of the language, you know, a whole way of life is disappearing and it needs certain ways of thinking about reality and you know, where the language is very much tied up with what we call religion and so on. So this is a tragic loss of diversity. Uh, uh, and, and, and really not one that has much, much I, I, I see really, in fact, no prospect for reversing that uh, loss of heterogeneity. Uh, 